Good afternoon on uh, Veterans Day. And uh, like you, perhaps, I thought of uh, family and friends who have contributed to the country and that the country has more to do for our veterans. But I spoke about that yesterday, so I won't layer over <laughs> uh, repeating myself. The uh, day was spent in part outdoors doing farm chores, but also we visited a good friend, uh, Michael O'Connor, and he had a breakfast over there. And I was uh, pleased to see that one of his guests was Eileen filler Corn, who was the speaker in the General Assembly in the House, I think the only woman ever to hold that position in, say, 400 years, <laughs> meaning ever. And uh, she is firmly committed to run for Congress for Jennifer Wexton's seat. And Jennifer, because of uh, uh, a disability she anticipates with a, a very tragic uh, health condition she has, will not be able to run again. And so uh, Eileen will. And the, I'm not saying she's the only one, but she's a very impressive woman. And Holly, who's not easily persuaded, uh, who hadn't met her, uh, immediately hugged her mask and all uh, and thanked her for what she'd done in the General Assembly. I think it's an indicator of what she could do in Congress. And she's dealt with some very difficult situations. And she has dealt with uh, a situation in which the Democrats struggled to build coalitions to pass legislation in the shorter period that our General Assembly in Virginia has to work. And she's got uh, high marks on constituent matters. So think about her. Uh, there will be others uh, who are thinking of running or who will run, and they will announce when, they, when their appropriate time comes. As for the issues that we're dealing with these days, well, uh, the Democrats, and uh, both in the House and the Senate, are of the view what we should have is a continuing resolution with everything at the same level as it was in 2023. And uh, that's a non-starter for the Republicans, who, under the, if you can call them that, uh, new leader, the Speaker, Johnson, first proposed, well, we should give $14 billion to Israel and deduct $14 billion from IRS from their budget. That went nowhere, and even if it could figure out a way to go in the House, it would never have gone in the Senate. So he's come up with another proposal that even his own uh, conference, that is a Republican conference and Republican members in the House, are not interested in, and it's a layered, C, a laddered rather, a laddered CR, so that by mid-January, certain agencies will get funding, and then other agencies in February. And it smells like something in which, yeah, we'll, we'll pass this stuff in January and we'll sc screw you in February, which is one reason why we want everything on the table and everything agreed, and we want a continuing resolution. And we have to get our act together before... Uh, Friday, I guess. I think it's uh, midnight Friday, this upcoming Friday, where we have this uh, dead, do or die deadline. Um, in the news, there's another troubling aspect, and it is that, well, day to day we have different variations of the troubles, if you will. And the troubles right now are that there's bombing going on and hospitals are being bombed. And the theory for doing that is that Hamas is using the hospitals to protect themselves uh, because, in a way, they're using the hospital as a shield. Or maybe that's the only thing they're doing. But in some instances, apparently, the uh, Israelis have allowed people to leave the hospital and then resume the bombing. Well, imagine if you had any condition at all in a hospital. Imagine if you had a slight condition and the bombing is going on. But that is the policy. And uh, the United States is jawboning, and I don't mean to say that they're not trying, but we have a lot of funds and ability to put pressure on Israel to try to work toward 
a peaceful settlement rather than blow up the center of the earth because there is this agitation throughout the region which doesn't take much to break into fury and fighting and war and death and destruction. Now, this may be unsolvable. We may not be able to make that happen, but that's an objective we should be working toward more than what we're doing now. Bombing hospitals suggests, without knowing any law, you'd have to think, boy, that sounds wrong. Bombing a school, doesn't that sound bad? How about children are dying? That's bad, we know that. But is there really any group that you could say, well, it's okay to kill those people? Well, combatants normally is a, a definition that we hear. And is it excusable if I can't get at the combatants to attack women and children? Seniors, citizens, whom? Whom may you attack in a war? And we have tried to fashion rules for war. And understandably, the rules go out the window at the first engagement. And that's what's happened here. So how do we get back to a place of peace a place where America is comfortable to be on the side of settling this matter rather than extending it. This cannot be an issue that has to do with satisfying and balancing constituencies in America. This has to be a decision that's based on what's right and fair. Now, on the Republican side, I don't know if you saw a statement by... Uh, uh, Pisaki, and I thought it was a good one. She was talking about how those who would be presidential contenders, <laughs> that they expressed their position about Israel. And it was really to ground uh, Hamas and Gaza into the earth. That's not an acceptable position. And it's not realistic. And it certainly would lead to a larger commitment, and the question is, should we be behind that, and how, and where? So the Republicans, even the wannabes, are nowhere. There is, I think, no Republican voice to come forward and say, this is how we do this, and that's a shame. The way the Republican candidates match up is basically, it's Haley versus DeSantis. So, what does that mean? Well, there are two other bad candidates. And when they say one of those will be against Trump, what does that mean? At a convention? In uh, the primaries? The Republican primaries? One of those will come forth and then be the opposition to Trump? Or will he be in jail? Meanwhile, on the Democratic side... Uh, there's more and more talk about additional players coming in to challenge Biden. I think I probably can safely say <laughs> to my fellow travelers here that that is the stupidest idea. And I said it yesterday. No one has any idea what a presidential campaign is like. And I, I have observed it closer, but unless you do it, you don't know it. I've been in campaigns, I think I've said this before, in which uh, the people working in the campaign say, this would be a great campaign if we had a different candidate. <laughs> and I think when I ran for Congress, maybe there was behind my back some of that kind of talking as well. And there are complaints that are made to you, and then you, you can deal with those. Not always with satisfaction, but you can do that. So this is the crazy world we live in. Courtroom cases going on, politics moving forward, bad decisions being made, constructive government by the wayside, and the worst of us think they're the rightest of us, and there are even open statements that voting isn't all it's cracked up to be. Now, I never understood why people like the musical Hamilton. First of all, yes, the music is great and the songs are wonderful, but they're all a fiction. They are not the story of Hamilton. Hamilton, if you read the Federalist Papers, he basically thought that 
democracy was not the best government, and he said it. And from him to, if you want, Speaker Johnson, there's a continuous line of people who are close to the monarchical. And Adams, John Adams, who followed uh, in Hamilton's theory, he, uh, as much as was trying to call President Washington his imperial majesty, he couldn't get past it either. So keep in mind that what we're fighting is also a number of people who not only have the policies wrong, but they also have the structure, the governmental structure wrong. And our governmental structure is a republic, a democracy. It is not the monarchy that Hamilton could be comfortable with <clears throat> and said so. Go read the Federalist paper. I don't remember the number right now, but if I get it, I'll, well, I'll get it sometime. I'll share it with you. Now, then uh, what else do we have? We have an interesting constitutional issue, which is really distressing to me. At the same time, we have Pope Francis saying we're going to open roads of acceptance and participation to transgender persons. One of the things that they discussed was um, baptism. Now, here in Virginia, we have a law that passed in 2020, I believe, it was the Virginia Values Act. And among other things, it was to protect against discrimination LGBTQ people. And that is critically important given the widespread discrimination endorsed by many other religions and by many individuals in religions claiming all sorts of slanderous and terrible things and denials of equality of such people. So there's a fella in Virginia, Bob Updegrove, and he takes photographs. And he said he should not have to take photographs at a same-sex gay wedding. Well, yes, he should if he's called upon. And if he doesn't, that's discrimination. And it's a violation of the Virginia Values Act. And get this, he doesn't have a single instance in which a gay couple has asked for him to take these wedding photos. <laughs> and the attorney general who is a right-wing nut and respects the law as often as my dogs speak aloud, he has the view that, oh, you know, you, know, you can't tell this guy. And he tries to read into the, the cake-making case, which also didn't involve a real person and a real event. It was a, a set of stipulated facts. Uh, he says... Oh, well, we, we, he doesn't have to take those pictures. So you see, America is, a, is in a very touchy place. And we've had periods of grace when we could imagine and, and carry through on great projects. But in recent years, not really so. And we have to, we have to clean out the rubbish First of all, those who would challenge our form of government. Second of all, those who would discriminate against every kind of person imaginable that just doesn't fit their, their, their liking, if you will. We have to encourage more education. We have to encourage protection of the environment. We have to do the things that are like the good housekeeping seal of approval for a civilized nation. And the definition of a civilized nation, forgive me for saying it again, the measure of a civilized civilization is how do we treat our own? And the answer is like shit, badly. There's something wrong with the nature of politics in America. And in almost every case, the cancer springs from the Republicans. So until their leadership is ousted, we have to fight in every way we can. And we have to expect that they're going to try to cut votes out in key states so that the people don't actually vote in the election. They're deceived into voting in a way that breaks up the election so that their position does not favor outcomes. And 
their position, that is, the one that doesn't believe really in government, in the general welfare, doesn't believe in equality, and doesn't believe in a democracy, they're doing everything they can to prevail. And who among us, putting aside all the other Republicans, could be comfortable with Trump in the West Wing again? I don't think any could. So, speaking to you from our Cathedral of Trees, and it's beautiful out here, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.